We hope you all enjoyed this morning's keynote speaker and had an engaging network, networking break, which was graciously, graciously sponsored by Intercept. We want to welcome you all to our first break out of the day. This is track two, building and activating your community. I'm Michael, and I will be your breakout host for this morning's session. I would like to also welcome those of you who will be joining us remotely through um, the live stream and would like to recommend, remind everyone joining us to download our mobile app in order to use some of our highlighted features such as the live Q&A. Today's session, we are here finding others and building your community. We will hear from experts and advocates on how to create momentum and successfully increase their community numbers. They will share with you their best practices in utilizing their resources to grow. Today, we'll be, today we will be hearing from Dan Hinman, Community Manager at Mayo Clinic and President at Hive Strategies, Roberta Smith, President of Allergeal Syndrome Alliance, and Garen Wilson, Head of Patient Partnerships of Genentech. Let's welcome them up. Thank you for that introduction, Michael, and thank you for joining us in our session today. It's my great pleasure to be with you here. Our first daughter was born as what I thought as a dad was the most beautiful and perfect baby I'd ever seen. She was about two weeks old when she got, her skin started to appear jaundiced. And so we went to the pediatrician. He said, just take her clothes off, put her in the windowsill, let her get plenty of vitamin D and she'll be fine. Well, a couple weeks later, she wasn't fine. And so we went back and our pediatrician sent us to a specialist. I'll never forget sitting in a conference room at the primary children's hospital in Salt Lake City when the doctor came in the room and said, we have very bad news for you. Your daughter has a rare disease called biliary atresia. What that means is that she's born without a bile duct. And this was uh, er, um, several decades ago. And the doctor said, honestly, there's really nothing we can do. There are some experimental surgeries that, that we could maybe prolong her life, but, but there's no long-term solution. And so I remember sitting in that room with, I was 24, my wife was 20, faced with the most devastating decision that we had to make in our life. And after considering all the pros and cons and ramifications, we thought the best thing for her would be just to take her home, love her, stay connected with the doctor, pray for a miracle, and do the best we could as parents. Well, that miracle never came, and sadly, four months later, she died in my wife's arms. Since that time, my whole career has been involved in advertising, marketing, public relations, and about 10 years ago, I started focusing on healthcare and social media. I began, uh, became a member of the Mayo Clinic social media network, and then about five years ago, Mayo hired me to manage that network. So I've been immersed in, in uh, social media and healthcare through that experience. I also have started a company called Hive Strategies, where I provide expert advice for Facebook patient support groups. Both of those, I realize, have been driven by that experience with my daughter, Eliza. And as when Daniel Thompson and others invited me to come speak to you today, I thought, what is the most important thing I can share with this group? And I felt like the most important thing I could do is to tell you, what would I do if Eliza was born today? It's a whole different world. We had no social media. We had no internet. There was no way I could connect with anybody but that doctor in that room to find out what my best recourse would be. Today, you have so many opportunities. And so for the next seven or eight minutes, I'm gonna share with you some key messages. One has to do quickly with research. Two, we're going to talk about the importance of strategy in developing a, a plan to build community and connect with others. We'll share a few resources that I think could be helpful as well. So the first thing I would do is I would start with research. That's pretty obvious. You're going to go to Google and find out everything you can that's out there. Also, you're going to reach out to the social media platforms. 
So check what's going on on Facebook and on Instagram, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on YouTube, and research all those sites to gather all the information that you can. Then you want to develop your strategy. Strategy really consists of five key elements. You need a clear objective. You need to identify who your audience is. You need to refine your message and use that consistently. You need to then decide which social media channels will be the most effective for you to reach that audience and then measure your success. And by the way, if you have the Global Genes app and you go to my speaker profile, Dan Hinman, H-I-N-M-O-N, my speaker profile, you'll see on that profile at the bottom a PDF that you can download that's a very simple form that covers these five steps of strategy. So that might be able to help you as you consider how this would fit for you. So let's talk for a minute about objective. An objective could be that I want to connect with other parents. An objective could be I want to influence researchers. Another objective could be I want to reach out to politicians who are in a position to make a difference. Another objective might be I want to connect with others who have this same disease. So it's very important that you, that you say that you specify your objective from the beginning. The next thing you want to identify is who is my audience. When I give this presentation to other groups, one of the common responses is, well, it's everyone. But I want to tell you, <laughs> everyone is not a good answer. And the reason for that is because you don't have enough time and energy and resources to reach everybody. It's, at, it's just impossible. And so what you want to do is narrow down to those people that you want to reach that meet your obje objectives, right? So if I want to connect with other parents, now my audience is other parents, right? If I want to find out more about research, now my audience is researchers, physicians, right? And so it's critical that you narrow that audience so that you can be strategic in the work that you do, your efforts. Now what do you want your audience to know? This is all about developing your message and you want to focus really on three things. What do I want them to know? What, how do I want them to feel? And what do I want them to do? So when you're crafting messages for social media, it's important that you keep those brief. You're not always going to be able to approach all three of those things in one post. You might have one post where you're educating people about the rare disease. Another post where you share a story that elicits emotion and helps people to feel compassion. And another post that says, here's what we need to do now to make a difference. Might be one post, but it could be various posts. But keep those three things in mind because you want to move people from knowledge to feeling to acting in, in your social media efforts. Now, which social media channels should you pick? Because Facebook isn't the answer to everyone, right? For instance, if you're looking for younger people, that audience of say 20 to 35, 40, those folks are dominantly on Instagram. So you'd want to select Instagram as the platform that you would be focusing on to accomplish that objective. If you want to reach a general audience, then you have Facebook and YouTube. Physicians, researchers, and politicians, they're on Twitter. So you'd want to have a presence on Twitter to find people. And then professionals obviously gather around LinkedIn as a platform. So do you see the flow here? If you have a clear objective and you know who you want to reach and what your message is, now you say, I'm going to take that message to this specific platform where I know these people are already gathering and share it there. Now you want to tell your own unique story, right? It is your story as a caregiver, as a, as a rare disease patient, as an advocate, 
with your emotion and passion that drives your messaging. And um, Roberta, in our next presentation, will talk more about that story and how you can take that story and apply it to various methods of reaching out to people. So here are just three examples of how this strategy works. So if I, as the dad of a daughter with biliary atresia, wanted to connect, that was my objective, to find other parents whose children have biliary atresia, then I would say, who's my audience? They're those parents who are probably between about 20 and 40. What's the message? My message is help. I'm new at this. I need to find out what my options are. What have you tried? What is the social media I'm going to use? Instagram and Facebook are perfect for that. And then how do I measure success? Am I really connecting with other parents? Here's another example. Suppose I want to learn. My objective is to find current research and possible cures for bil biliary atresia. Audience, physicians and researchers. Message, what are my options? Social media, Twitter is where they gather. Frequently they post on YouTube. So those two, and we'll talk about hashtags in a moment. And then how do I measure it? I'm connecting with physicians and researchers. So I know I'm being successful and getting the information that I need. Here's one other, one other idea, and that is if my objective was to organize. I want to build a community of parents whose children have biliary atresia. My audience, again, adults, my message, here is my story. What is your experience? How can we help each other through this? Social media, Facebook, Facebook groups if there are, and Instagram, and then message, we are supporting each other. So here are a few ideas for resources in your journey to accomplish this. How many of you are familiar with simpler.com? Who knows about this site? Very few of you, okay, good. Simpler is an amazing repository of hashtag use on Twitter particularly. You go to this, simpler.com, don't worry about joining, paying any fees, find the, the uh, healthcare hashtag section on the site, and here you will find all, a list of like 1,500 healthcare hashtags that you can go through and say, which is, is my disease already there? Or is there one that's close to what I'm trying to do that might also be a resource for me? You'll learn there not only what hashtags to use, in, not just in Twitter, but also in, in LinkedIn, in Facebook, in Instagram, to connect with those communities. You'll also find out who are the influencers, who are the 10 or 20 people that are most active in social media on those communities. This is a great resource for connecting. You also may want to join the Mayo Clinic Social Media Network. This is the community that, that I manage for Mayo Clinic. This is composed, online community, composed of healthcare marketers and communicators, um, clinicians, patient advocates and patients who want to improve their social media skills. That's what it's all about. We have 5,000 members of this community who are involved in social media ongoing. You can join as a basic member, pay nothing, and have access to the community forum where you can get, uh, ask and answer questions, read what other people are learning. You can access our blog posts, our daily curated news. If you join as a premium member, you have access also to to uh, webinars and to an online certificate. It's not essential for you to learn what you need to. So that's a resource you could consider. Another resource would be Mayo Clinic Connect. How many of you are familiar with this patient community? So here, maybe again, just a handful of you. This is Mayo Clinic's online community for patients with all kinds of diseases. It's not just for Mayo patients, it's anybody. Here again, you can join this for free. You can search for others who are experiencing similar things that you are in your disease and find some connections and information there. I started this presentation, of course, with the story about me and my daughter Eliza. 
And I said, I wanted to share with you what I would do if Eliza was born today. And, and this is a path. Do all your research. Make sure you have a strategy, a clear strategy in place. It will save you so much work and effort if you know from the beginning who you want to reach, what your objectives are, what the message is, the best platform to be on, and how to measure your success. And then I'd, I'd look for resources like Simpler and the social media network and Mayo Clinic Connect in order to help me to, do, to, to accomplish what I really wanted to do. Even with all of its warts and problems, social media is a gift. When we sat in that room that day, I would have given anything for the ability to connect. And the opportunity that you, and the thing that we missed and that meeting was hope. We had no hope. We had a death sentence for our daughter. And so what I hope today is that you will feel hopeful, that you'll be able to know that there are numerous resources, that you'll have these tools to connect, and that they will be able to bless your lives and help you to be successful in, in your efforts. Thank you so much for your time. Oh. Hi, all. Oh. So, my, my name's, name's Roberta. Roberta. I'm from the Algeal Center of Alliance. I'm going to move things around here. So, who thinks they have social media totally in the bag here? Anybody? I don't either. So, first of all, Roberta Smith, Algeal Syndrome Alliance, and I came to the Algeal Syndrome Alliance because I have twin daughters that are 15, almost 16. One has Algeal, uh, one does not. And in the rare disease community, everybody knows we need to relate. We need to relate to someone who has dealt with the same situations that we've dealt with, someone who is going through the same um, appointments, the same you know, job loss, financial strain, um, whatever it is that we're all dealing with, uh, you know, part of building your community stems from the need to connect to someone dealing with what you're dealing with. So making connections that count and doing that over and over is the key. And how to do that, I don't know as if anybody has it totally in the bag, but we sure try to throw the needles or the uh, noodles against the wall to try to make them stick. And we try to go with that over and over. So if we build it, we're hoping that they'll come, right? So how do you find the people that you're looking for? I'm gonna play off of what Dan said um, a, a little bit here, but also talk about some major key things that you need to do as a nonprofit that will help you bring the community together. Building a website is gonna be very important because in a rare disease community, what's the first thing most people do? Well, they're going to Google and they're hoping that they can find an organization that they can connect with. Oops, we wanna go back. Uh, we wanna build a strong social media strategy that fits your capacity. Many of our rare disease organizations are very small. We don't have the capacity to have a huge uh, uh, strategic plan that will, like Dan said, um, you know, reach everyone. We just can't do that. So we have to be realistic about that. Connect with our key stakeholders. It's important that when you're connecting with families, you're not only connecting with your families, but you're creating relationships in industry, uh, pharma, other nonprofits, because these are the ones that are gonna help you build your community. Finding existing support groups. You know, we, many of us are here today to understand where some pockets of, of people that you need to build your community are. So one of the things that our families do are they're always looking for a support group. Um, join the support groups, find them. If you can't find them, create one. People will come to you if you, you know, advertise that on your social media. Start relationships with families and treat those relationships as long, you know, long-standing relationships that you're gonna continue to have throughout your journey. That's extremely important. Patient voice is extremely important and you wanna help uh, cultivate those relationships continuing forward. And build your resources and distribute th those consistently. When you do that, people start to lean on you 
uh, for your consistent just showing up. The power of social media and the rare disease is very big. Here's some stats I've pulled. Uh, the internet has 4.4 billion users. There are 3.499 billion active social media users. On average, people have 7.6 social media accounts. The average daily time spent on social uh, media is 142 minutes a day. Facebook is, should be 2.375 billion users. Instagram, 1 billion. LinkedIn, 610 million users. And Twitter, 330 million users. That's a lot of people and a lot of opportunity to start to cultivate and build a community. And it's a, it also gives you, you know, the, the opportunity to see what sticks for your organization as far as social media goes and what people are connecting to. Well, I like to say we thumb through as rare disease uh, organizations sometimes if we don't have the uh, education in social media and we don't really know how to get that, we're really playing social media plinko, right? So this is the, the best price is right game. Garen thinks so, and so do I. <laughs> but what we're doing is we're standing up with a, a chip and we're letting it go and we're praying to God it hits the jackpot. And a lot of us start by just creating social media posts and hoping that they hit the jackpot with our families and resonate. It's super important to try to do that, but we can't always hit the mark, so we have to keep trying until we find out what, what does stick. Well, so Plinko is, is it a game of chance or is it certainty? With social media, you're always gonna have a little game of chance, but you can create more certainty in building your uh, community by understanding why social media is important. Well, it helps you reach a wider audience, which is definitely a goal that we have. You engage with distant supporters. So, rare disease, man. We've got international families all over the world. How are we going to reach them? Draw people to your website. It's very important. That's where we house a lot of our information. Uh, we have scientists and, and um, um, Pharma and biotech, they're going there to see what you're doing. And you want to legitimize your brand. As nonprofits, we do have a brand. And we need to advertise that through our social media and be very strong about what that brand is. Well, why? Well, our brand offers a different kind of product. It offers a promising future, right? It offers more social, uh, socially aware community which helps you really build the basis of bringing your community together. So like Dan said, we need to really work on nailing down our objectives. What are we trying to accomplish? A lot of people, when they do try things as nonprofits and they build posts and they try to reach their community, if they're not receiving the feedback, positive feedback, or the posts or the engagement that they're looking for, it creates a fear and it stalls the progress forward. I like to say to my kids, don't be a freedy cat. And we have to continue to push through that fear to try to connect to our families. Like Dan said, distributing to the appropriate stakeholders through the appropriate channels is very important. He had a great slide up that Facebook is the general population, Instagram is the younger population, Twitter, physicians, researchers, politicians, LinkedIn, industry, corporate, and other professionals. Each one of them has a different type of posting or message that we're gonna be sending. So, you know, if we hashtag a lot on one, hashtags might not work on the other. If we're linking to something, they might work better on a, on a different channel, and you need to research that. Well, the anatomy of a social media post, there are four main things. A clear picture, a concise caption, a call to action, and a link. Not every post is gonna have all those. This creativity lends for, you know, just taking one or two of those, or shaking it up, maybe three of those. So let's start with a clear picture and a concise caption. This one here of this little boy, instead of don't stare, let's start teaching, say hello. That sends a very clear message that all of us can relate to here in rare disease. Sometimes our diseases are invisible. 
And when that happens, it's still a matter of teaching. You're still teaching. That's what we're always going to be teaching. This post garnered 6.9, uh, I'm sorry, 6,900 um, engagements. It was, a, it was a, a big one because it's relatable. Some disabilities look like this. Basically, that saying invisible, 7.5 thousand engagements. A clear picture and concise caption. A clear picture, you don't want it to be overly messy, and you don't want it to you know, fall off the rails of, of smearing the message. Your illness does not define you. Your strength and courage does, something many of us uh, fight through adversity to get people to understand. That, that picture there uh, brought in 6,500 engagements. Here's one of ours that our executive director, Cher Bork, made, took photos of many of our children and has a clear message here, just an education piece that we are engaging, it's a, a, a clear message, we're engaging and bringing in our community into the post. When they're a part of it, they can share it, they can be proud that they're part of something, and it, it really sends a positive message to not only your community and that you're engaging with the community, but also to their followers, their family members, their friends, their supporters. And when you get them on board, they'll then support you. Call to action with a link. So here we have our ALGS assistance program. It's a new, fairly new program for us. We use that in a post to uh, discuss the, you know, the importance of the program, uh, the directions. We have a call to action here for them to go to this link and consider this, you know, applying for this program. And then we provide the link there. Well, where will the Plinko chip take us? Where will it fall? Things that strengthen your social media goals. Understand your capacity. In rare disease, many of our organizations are very small, and we don't have the capacity, like Dan said, to try to get everyone. Try to figure out at least the three main audiences that you're trying to connect to, and focus on that. You don't want to run yourself too thin, because you're not going to be able to do it all. And if it, if it means connecting with one social media group, and really getting good at that, and then moving on to a second social media group, that's OK. You'll get there. So understanding the capacity is very important. Don't bite off more than you can chew. It's because if you bite that off and you start doing it and then you fall flat and then you try to pick that back up and you fall flat again, you're not showing consistency with your community and your constituents and your stakeholders. Find the pulse on the community that you serve. The reason that I have the noodle here is that when I started out in social media on our um, in our organization, I really, what drove me to the organization was connecting with other parents to understand what they were going through. And it was that personal connection that drove me to try to find answers, but it also drove me to connect to more parents. And social media, like Dan said, is just a tremendous gift. So I just, I winged it. I didn't have, a, I didn't have the social media education. A lot of us just wing it, and that's what I did. Um, we do posts, we see how they are. If it doesn't work, we try again. See how that works, keep going. Be relatable. Well, if we go back to think about those other posts that I did, how many of you related to any of those messages? Anybody? It's a very clear message that sometimes comes from pain, from experience, comes from what you've learned from other organizations, what you've learned from other families, it's the life's journey that sometimes is really the backbone of a great social media post. Let's enhance those posts. Let's get creative. We need to tag your corporate partners. Very important. And when you do that, you then open up to their community and, and those who are watching them and seeing them. Nonprofit, industry, and individual partners when appropriate. Leverage the power of a great hashtag. Can never, you never waste that opportunity. Show your personality. Humor is so important. I find a lot of the posts that I connect to have a serious tone with a little humor twist, and that's what pulls me in. Shake it up. Mix up your content. 
Those posts that you saw, they weren't always posts that I made. They were posts that I found somebody else used and it worked for them, and that's okay. You don't always have to make up all the content. Sometimes a simple message is the most powerful. Show up, keep going, follow through, be consistent. That's what's gonna help build your community. As an organization, as individuals, as pharma and biotech working in a certain industry, you have to tell the story of your tribe. That's why we're all here, to connect, to tell our story to others who will listen, to make connections and network. It's all about the story. What drives your commitment and motivates you? Tell, you know, I have to tell my personal story. Where I got where I am today with the context that I have and the community that we have built as an organization, sometimes it starts with one story. It is the link that makes us all, you know, connected. It's so important. Lean on other nonprofit partners. As you're mingling, talk to other nonprofits. You need to understand what they're doing, what works. Don't be scared to ask them questions about what's happening in their organization. Some of the best advice we've ever received were from some of our nonprofit partners. And I don't think any of us should be scared to share the ins and outs of um, the things that haven't worked for us and the things that have. So don't reinvent the wheel. It's a waste of your time. Lastly, teach others how to share their story. In, in my organization, it is so important, I try to advocate to everyone, including families, how important their story is. It can't always be about my story. It's not the Roberta show. And when we have other people in the organization sharing their personal stories, then their communities are getting built. And then ultimately their communities become our communities. Not only that, but your story will grab the heartstrings of others that are looking at you to work in your industry or your disease state, to work with your organization because you're connecting with them. Be real, tell the story, share the story, teach the story. That's all I have. Good morning, everybody. And I'll stand on this side of the room to balance out, show some love to the left. Um, so good morning, everybody. I'm Garen Wilson. I work at Genentech within our Alliance and Advocacy Relations Group. And that group is really charged with making sure that patients have a seat at the table uh, for the work that we do at Genentech, which is researching and bringing uh, medicines to market. Now, my talk will be a, a bit of a departure from uh, what my colleagues Dan and Roberta just shared. Um, but a lot of that content actually feeds in quite nicely to the discussion that I'd like to have with all of you now. Uh, I'm a Global Genes first timer, so hopefully I, I rise to the, to the, to the occasion and, and just rise to the standard that was set by Dan and Roberta, because I think um, those insights related to how to engage populations through social are so rich and so useful for um, what we're really charged, in tap, uh, really charged with addressing right now, which is um, ensuring that we can broaden inclusion of historically underrepresented groups in clinical research. And the reason that's important is because uh, we want to ensure that we are committed to and in investing in health equity, uh, addressing disparities where we know they exist. And the industry is changing, healthcare is changing, we're moving into precision medicine and personalized healthcare, the ability to uh, unlock the potential of uh, computer technology with all the brilliant minds in this room and, and with our you know, physician community to really um, drive healthcare outcomes forward in, in, uh, in some really powerful ways. And so I think this is one area that at Genentech we found that is critically important to make sure that um, our research is sound, we have great integrity, and that we're really opening up the net to bring in groups that we haven't historically uh, seen in our research programs. And many of the, the, the approaches that you two just highlighted, I think, are, are going to be key for us to connect with communities where they're at and ensure that uh, patients understand and are educated about um, the state of healthcare and where we're going. So, what's a pharmaceutical company without a bunch of legalese? Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we, uh, by the end of the presentation, you guys will get a bit uh, more familiar with, with Genentech as an organization. Uh, and then I'll also um, dive directly into 
uh, the disparity that we want to focus on now and how we're uh, approaching reaching underserved communities uh, to ensure that they are part of the research process and then uh, give you guys a, a sense or plant the seed on how we think about this to really drive inclusive research to make sure that all clinical research really uh, delivers and generates information that's meaningful um, to help all of the healthcare decisions that we, we face when we're encountering those, those conversations with our physicians and, um, and that we, we have the right kind of information to, to drive those insights forward and really improve outcomes. So a bit about Genentech. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with this company, I think uh, Genentech is a, is a biotech company. I would say we're largely, uh, like the, most of our, our operations sit within oncology, immunology, uh, but over the past couple of years, we've uh, really made significant investments in, in rare disease and neuro-rare disease. Uh, last year, we um, brought a molecule for hemophilia to the market. Uh, we have robust and active, active programs in spinal mus muscular atrophy and, and Huntington's disease. My colleague, uh, JP, in the room is, is, uh, is leading a lot of those efforts. Uh, and a couple of overarching kind of areas of significant investment for the company uh, sit within personalized healthcare, which is really just taking all of the data that we have about uh, individuals' health experience and empowering and unlocking new insights by coupling that with sophisticated uh, advanced technologies and artificial intelligence to really uh, empower physicians in their decision making uh, when, when treating disease. And What's germane to that is inclusive research, making sure that the data that feeds into that system really represents all of us in this room uh, so that we can benefit from those personalized insights. So as we get into that, I'll actually just pause for a second and play a brief video to give you guys some context on the discussion. So our world is changing. The tapestry of genetics is changing. Scientific research has produced significant societal advances. However, not all segments of the population have benefited equally. You know, if you're not at the table, um, it's really hard for you to have an impact. If you're not reaching many ethnicities well, um, how can we actually have personalized healthcare? And right now, not enough of our trial patients reflect the diversity of patients who experience disease. It's not personalized if you're a minority. So it's very important to me um, that research include all of those people so that we can understand the disease process better and understand how our therapies work in all of these populations. I'm excited about the opportunity to really be a, a catalyst. Genentech is actually asking the right questions and trying to make a social contribution. It's an imperative. It's not an ethical dilemma. Genentech and Roche is viewed as the preeminent leader in oncology research and research for a whole host of um, serious and life-threatening illnesses. This is important to Genentech as a business because every patient matters. Future medicines have to be designed for the patients of the future and understanding these differences across populations are important now and they're going to become increasingly important in the future. It's really important to Genentech to have uh, inclusive research and, and have participation in our clinical trials of all kinds of people. And uh, I'm really excited that we have an opportunity to advance that now. All right, so that sets the backdrop for uh, the discussion. This is very personal for me. I think, uh, you know, I admire the stories that were shared. Uh, so a year ago, my father actually was diagnosed with, uh, with stage four pancreatic cancer. And as I was uh, getting invested in this work, you know, I spent a, a lot of time both kind of uh, learning about the space, learning about disparities in research, how you know communities of color have you know engaged the medical community and have been able to you know advocate for themselves in this environment, uh, focusing on that at, at Genentech while also dealing with this very very personal significant diagnosis at home and and trying to work with him to actually and work with his care team and physicians to uh, to create some opportunities for him to be a part of research programs and why is that important? Well, in oncology particularly uh, clinical researches and clinical trials are a guideline recommended in treatment environment. Um, this is an environment where you have the best you know, physicians and clinical teams kind of wrapped around a patient to ensure that uh, your experience is ripe, that we're doing the most that we can to ensure that patients have a positive outcome. Uh, I fought that fight and unfortunately, you know, it, it, it didn't end the way I wanted it to. Uh, he you know, wasn't able to get into a clinical trial and the disease progressed and he passed away. But I think what stood with me is that you know, this is something that people need to be empowered to know how to, uh, you know, know how significant and how important this topic is. 
uh, and then be empowered and given tools so that they can have this type of discussion with their care team and, and be able to really have that shared decision-making discussion that allows patients to participate in the research process. Uh, for us, inclusive research you know, essentially is uh, really just tackling this disparity at its heart um, and just really trying to enable the promise of personalized healthcare. If you look at the top of the screen, you can see that the, the tapestry of the country is changing. Uh, you know, the, the, if you're in several states, um, you know, they're already a minority majority states. And so the information that we generate in clinical research actually supports the decisions that physicians may make. I think, you know, this has been a topic that's been very, very uh, uh, discussed and very prominent in the literature as well as in more mainstream media now. If, if uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, if you are an HBO subscriber and you, you look at last week, Tonight with John Oliver, you would see he did a, a deep dive in disparities in, in medical bias and disparities within healthcare. And uh, he highlighted the fact that uh, for, I think this, in large part, uh, I think the most stark example of uh, the significance of inclusive research is looking at uh, how we've come to understand heart disease and how we've come to understand how patients present when having a heart attack. Um, and for many years, I think there's a classic presentation of, you know, you, there's a numb left arm and, you know, this sense of impending doom in your chest. And a lot of that understanding of the presentation of, of cardiac disease, of, our, of a heart attack, was born out of our understanding of treating men. And for many, many years, women, you know, were going undiagnosed and not treated appropriately when presenting with different symptoms, having pain in their jaw, feeling anxiety, uh, those symptoms were not being associated with having a heart attack. And if you think about that, like how many women have passed away because their symptoms weren't properly identified and the significance of their disease was not um, taken into consideration and treated appropriately. I think that's a big macro example of the significance of more representative research. And a lot of the focus on this work, I think we've made some strides in that regard, um, but now we really have to focus in on, uh, in this instance, we're focusing on communities of color as a learning example here in the US, uh, but we've been charged to think about this more globally, so to think about patients who have comorbid conditions, women in other geographies and places around the world, how we can unlock and invite those communities to be a part of the research process. So we know that the disparities exist, we need to do something about it, and the, what we'll talk about is, is how we think about this and the work that we're doing to advance inclusive research. This probably doesn't come as a surprise to those of us in the room. Uh, if you look at the composition of the U.S. population, you can, you can see the, uh, you know, all minorities compared to, um, to, to white patient populations, about 33 uh, to 70% is the split there. But when you look at clinical research, uh, the NIH does a fairly good job because they mandate that the information that is generated for studies that they invest in and that they sponsor actually represent the complexion of the country. But industry, we have not had that mandate and we have not operated in that way. I think our prime directive has been speed in these research programs because we want to bring new medicines to market. Uh, and so as, as a result, you can see the, the representation that we've had in, in industry clinical studies. If you think about genomic data, so this is uh, information that's looking at a person's genetic composition looking at that of a particular tumor or cancer that that patient may be experiencing and trying to understand if there's some underlying biological driver of the disease. Now, this is really important because right now we're making medicines that target specific uh, genetic mutations. But if you look at the, the information that's available to uh, understand those differences and understand those connections, uh, you know, 80% of that information is largely homogenous and coming from uh, patients of Northern European or of European descent. And this is over 35 million samples. So I think this raises a couple of important questions. One, are we not properly identifying types of cancers and mutations that are actually driving disease for all patient populations because we don't have rich genetic diversity in our genomic assessments? And two, are patients not being appropriately treated because for those that we do know have specific genetic mutations where we have precision medicine, they're not getting the care that they, they need. So I think for those of you that are, have been a part of this conversation, there are a lot of different uh, issues that, that come to bear. I think a couple of the things that we've identified when we've had to take a very uh, close look at what we're doing is just we haven't done a good job at this. And I think you know, we, we looked in the mirror and realized that we have not prioritized this. 
We haven't told that to our investigators and those that are doing research and collaboration with the programs that we've done across the portfolio of our research programs. And we haven't supported patients the way that they need to be supported in order to be a participant in the research process. Um, so those are kind of the core areas of focus uh, of a lot of the, the, the puzzle pieces that you see on the slide. Um, but one thing that is also germane to this particular conversation is the way we show up to patient communities. Industry is not really viewed as a trusted broker. Many of you are, advocates are, you guys uh, or the, or, are the source of, of trust and respect within many patient communities. So I think we realize that we have to partner uh, in order to educate communities about uh, the significance of this, what research is and what it isn't, um, dispel some myths, and, and do that through a unique and innovative and emerging uh, way such as social media and, and uh, you know, and, and um, being more exhaustive in how we get this message out there. And that's, that's essentially what we're trying to tackle now. So our approach is very simple. Uh, there's a couple of things that kind of go into the way we think about this. Number one, I think we needed to realize that we needed information from advisors, from the community, uh, to help us understand where we've been falling short and how we can do a better job of really advancing inclusive research. So we uh, put together an external council. These are physician thought leaders across oncology, immunology, neuroscience. We have some patient advocate leadership on this, on this board, as well as uh, members from contract research organizations to help us identify the areas where we can have the most impact and help uh, partner with us to, to tackle this issue. We look at it in three different domains. What are our core research operations? How do they look? And what could we do better? How do we prioritize this when communicating with investigators? How do we let patient communities know that this is important and significant for them? And then how do we provide financial support and other type of support mechanisms that are germane to the research process and the research experience? We also think about this for the insights that can be generated that can help us better understand health and wellness. In order to map disease appropriately, you need a diversity of different experiences so we can separate out noise from true signals. And so that's what this uh, big part of this is, thinking about the, uh, the data assets that exist in the environment through electronic medical records, through patient registries, these type of rich data sources. How do we partner with groups to bring that information in so that we can drive our aspirations towards personalized healthcare. And I think the final and most important part in my mind is external partnerships. I think this is uh, just realizing that uh, we need all of you and we need um, partners like you in rooms like this to really help bring this education uh, where, it's most, where it's most needed. Many, many challenges, things that we've done to really in, you know, kind of uh, tackle this issue. I, I would say, I would highlight two things on this list. I think the first is prioritizing representative data in our research program. When we set out and develop a protocol, that really provides the blueprint for how a clinical study comes to life. The scientific questions that we're looking to address, uh, the types of patients that will be a part of that research program, and the types of support that we will provide to anybody that's within that research environment. Inclusive research wasn't a priority in the past, and so therefore, this, all of the downstream operational aspects of ensuring that that becomes real weren't taken into account, uh, speed was. And so in prioritizing this at the level of the protocol unlocks a lot of, unlocks a lot of uh, actual really tangible ways to uh, open up the tent and bring populations that haven't been a part of the research pro program into research. And I would say the second most important part of this is just supporting patients. Research can be expensive and there's costs that pe patients even bear in this process. Things like the travel to and from doctor's offices, uh, Certain procedures may not be covered by insurance. I think once we realized that there were these real gaps that patients were experiencing through looking at what communities of color were experiencing and why they weren't capable of being a part of research, uh, allowed us to realize that we have to do better for all patients and we have to cover these expenses to ensure that patients aren't holding any costs associated with research participation because it's just not right. So uh, we've unlocked you know, programs to, to provide zero cost to patients so that folks who are in our research programs experience no uh, cost associated with that participation. Uh, other host of things, you know, in the interest of time, I'll kind of skip over this. I think really this is about empowering study teams to make this real. So what are some principles that study teams can actually use to embed this into the work that they do? And then also an, a unique way of uh, empowering employers to support employees uh, who may want to consider research as a, as a treatment option. Uh, as, developing a clinical trial health benefit 
for Genentech employees. Uh, I think we realized as we start talking to employers that they have a big role in this. They're creating the health benefit plans that employees are using for their medical care. Uh, but there wasn't necessarily, at least within our case, there wasn't a position uh, in that environment around how we support our employees should they need to consider this as a treatment option. And we do research and we make medicine and, and this wasn't articulated in our policy, so we made that change. I think one way that we've found it's about external partnerships and really unlocking the potential you know, in, in, you know, with our partners is creating awards and uh, grant opportunities for patient advocates to come together with their best ideas on tackling this issue. Uh, so over the course of this past year, colleagues within the team, we put together these two awards that you see listed here, uh, one in neuroscience and the other in oncology, uh, to bring advocates together, uh, advocates that don't historically work with one another. I think that was, that was part of the design of this program uh, and created a grant opportunity for them to think about this issue and how they can make this real within their uh, respective therapeutic areas and within their patient communities. Uh, we've gotten some really great feedback from this program and it's something that we will uh, actually increase our investment in going forward. Just to highlight the importance of this, I think you know, this may be me kind of speaking to the choir here, but I think it's important because this is an access issue. This is about health equity. Uh, we know that research actually is a rich environment for best quality of care, so we need to make, we need to make sure that all patients have access to that environment and remove the barriers that exist that are preventing that. This is about science. There's a scientific underpinning and foundation to all of this work, which is trying to make sure we generate the best data that all providers have to make appropriate clinical decision make decisions because we know that the power of personalized healthcare is, is imminent and we wanna ensure that we're not exacerbating disparities by not addressing this now. This is about accelerating medicines to patient, increasing the funnel to bring more patients into the environment. Uh, and this is also about creating distinct patient solutions that span beyond the research environment and, and really open up a conversation about what does broad health equity look like. And that's, that's what I'm actually kind of really excited about uh, you know, more recently is the investments that we're thinking about making as an organization to really advance health equity and creating uh, solutions and more tools and more resources for patients uh, within the research environment and beyond. So with that, I think we have some time for q and I'll wrap my presentation and hand it over to, to Michael. Thank you very much. That was very informative. Amazing. Does anybody have any questions? My question is for those of you that are uh, well-versed in social media. I hear very different things about how often to post to Facebook or Instagram or whatever. Uh, the algorithms are changing and how often you're gonna be sh actually shown to your members. Do you have any advice on that? I do, am I on? Yeah. Um, really, it, it really depends on your capacity. Um, start small, if you wanna do one a day, one every other day, one every three days to start building a consistency and, and really building a strategy for yourself. Uh, I would say, like Dan said, maybe pick three uh, different channels of social media, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Instagram and Twitter, and set yourself up with a schedule that you can manage. Managing that schedule is very important. Facebook has a really neat um, uh, application to it where you can schedule in advance some of those. So if you have time, on a weekend, you could do a daily post and schedule those out for a week in advance, sometimes longer. So utilize those pieces of the social media channels in order to fit what you're capable of doing. And I would also um, say never be close to other social media channels as well. A prime example to that is in creating relationships with other people, talk about the social media that they're using. I met uh, a woman that was dealing with uh, her son had allergial syndrome uh, in Spain and created a relationship with her. And she introduced me to a WhatsApp group of over 17 mothers dealing with the syndrome in that WhatsApp group. We had no idea they existed. That group now has over 40 allergial mothers in it. So you always have to be open to it, but if you set yourself up with a good schedule, you can build up and move on to other channels.
Hi. Uh, <laughs> I have more of a statement than a question. Uh, my name is Beth, and I'm with the International Wagger Syndrome Association. And we use a platform called Canva to create all of our graphics mm -hmm. online. And if you are a nonprofit, they give you a free account. So if you're looking for a platform to use to create really engaging things, I would check them out. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Canva, is a, Canva is a great resource that uh, if you have a limited budget for sure, and then also it's very robust, so it's a great, great resource for creating graphics. A really great thing to do with Canva is when, we, when you pull in your community, if you put a call out to your community to say, you know, holiday pictures, send me all your Christmas pictures for your kids, you can take some of those pictures, get permissions from the family, pull those pictures into Canva and create a great clear caption. Having someone from your community as the picture just really, it really changes the dynamic of your social media and you need to find a way to consistently pull in your community. Um, hi, I have a question that maybe all of you can uh, give us some input on. I'm on the board of a nonprofit organization for a rare disorder that was not diagnosable before 2016. Um, in 2016, my daughter was one of six worldwide. We're now up to 78. We've only been able to connect with 55. Obviously, we have to greatly increase our numbers. Um, and we've had a problem reaching into countries like China, Russia, the continent of Africa, where we know there are patients, but we just cannot make any connections there. We know there's a patient in India. We know there's a patient in Egypt, but we're unable to make their connections. We're on all of these platforms that you've listed. Um, so I'm just wondering if you have any other suggestions on how we can reach into those areas of the world where we know there have to be patients, but we've mm -hmm. not been able to connect mm -hmm. with any. Do you want to touch on that? Well, those are tough because some of those countries you've mentioned are blocking social media and, and internet access. How do you get behind, behind, beyond the Chinese firewall? I don't know the answer to that, honestly. <laughs> Well, I can tell you, those patients have to see physicians. They have to attend a hospital. They have to have others in the community dealing with the same things that we're dealing with. So if you turn that around and, and pull away from the social media and think about who they would be connecting to, is it a rare disease organization in their country? Is it a rare disease organization in their community? You know, start reaching out to those individuals you know, there are main hospitals in a certain country. You can get to those hospitals and have discussions with the patient advocacy organizations there or the patient advocate in the hospital to even disseminate some of the information that you have to those patients to allow those patients to know who you are and give them an opportunity to call you. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. The thing is, every, every person dealing with rare disease, whether it's the clinician, the biotech, the farm, they all want the families to connect. They will make an effort to help facilitate that. If you tell your story, tell the story of your tribe, and try to make it personal and the importance of that connection. They, they will do it. You just gotta find the right person. Keep trying. So we had a question that was submitted um, through the uh, app and uh, the question was, um, you had mentioned the uh, website, what, what was it called again, Camp, Campa? Canva? Yeah. How do you, is it just www.canva.com? I, okay. I didn't hear. D does that help? Yeah. Hear it. So we can't hear your question, See, Michael. Oh, sorry. Can, is, the gentleman was wondering um, exactly where the website was you were talking about, how to spell that, C-A-N-V-A, www.canva, C-A-N-V-A.com. Okay. One more. Was it you that had the question? 
Uh, hi, everyone. I want to introduce myself. I came from the China, and uh, mm. yeah, so I want to are introduce myself. Are you myself. dealing with the firewall? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, we built our organization between, uh, before 11 years, and uh, five years before the Ice Bullion Kident Challenge event spread into China, and our organization with uh, Chinese Twitter um, take over this event, and the Red is the first time it became the public topic in the China. And after that, we became the first uh, uh, foundation named the China Illness uh, Illness uh, Challenge Foundation. And this time is our first time to um, connect with the global rare disease community. So we are coming. <laughs> wow. yeah. And uh, uh, in the last three years uh, in China, we got lots of the promotion in the public event and the promotion the government policy. We got a lot of the effort, and also our community got the more support by the, all the different, different uh, directions. So that is, uh, we come here, want to have the more connection with the healthy and the, uh, also the education and the research. So thank yes. you very much. <laughs> yes. Hi, this is the question for Genentech guy. Sorry, I forgot your name. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you for your presentation because I think communities of color and rare disease are not given a voice. Um, what would you say, though, to small nonprofits that are barely making it on limited funding? What would be three uh, top suggestions you would have for making sure these communities are included? I'm the executive director of the Hemophilia Foundation of Southern California. I have a son with hemophilia, and it's, it's difficult because we have many languages represented, but we want them all to be included. Mm -hmm. Translation is expensive. Translators are expensive. It's also very difficult to find um, medical practitioners that speak the language. So I would just be curious to know what you're doing. Um, they don't have access to clinical trials if they're monolingual Spanish or Chinese or Korean. And I think that that's also a really uh, not a good thing because as you know, with drug uh, sensitivities within ethnicities, that's yeah. a big issue. Yes. Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, I heard two questions in there. It sounds like, you know, what can a, um, a smaller nonprofit do to, to bring in resources that can help address these issues in a local community? And then what are we doing specifically in communities where we know that there are kind of different communities whose needs need to be, uh, we need to support them individually or support the communities individually? Uh, to the first question, I would say, um, what can nonprofits do to, um, to, to identify new opportunity? I would say that the health uh, equity space is uh, a, a space that I've observed where there are just opportunities to, for grants and, and funding for proposals that are focused on uh, health disparities. And those disparities can be broad, and you know, there's obviously we talked about you know, racial and ethnic uh, participation in clinical research. There's also, if you think about it, socioeconomic access disparities. There's urban-rural disparities and access to quality uh, institutions for, for care. Uh, so I would look for grants that are kind of within that health equity space. I, I know Genentech, we are you know, bringing more resources to that particular domain of, of interest. Uh, I've observed other companies uh, thinking and doing similar things. So I would say over the next few years, uh, we're all kind of responding to the environment. The FDA is dialing up, um, you know, pressure on the industry to, to, to do better. Uh, you know, in the oncology space, NCI is, you know, kind of a conduit of the National Institute of Health is, is putting pressure on, you know, academic institutions and hospitals to deliver on uh, the disparities within their respective catchment areas. So uh, I think environmentally the pressure is there for us to, to tackle these issues, and so we're looking for those ideas and proposals that address that. Uh, and to the second question, I think one thing that where you know, there could be an area, and this is kind of tying the two together, is uh, things are related to translation and bringing uh, culturally competent uh, educational materials to patients about 
the clinical research process, what it is, what it isn't, dispelling certain myths. Um, you know, there, you know, I would say you're right. Each community has like a different, um, you know, maybe issue or barrier to engagement. Uh, within the African American community, there's, you know, kind of historical perceptions of, you know, what research is given the Tuskegee experiment. I think right now within the Latino communities, we're hearing uh, a lot of concerns around the current political environment and, and you know, how information will be shared with, uh, you know, uh, government bodies, if, you know, if it will be, those, those questions are like out in the atmosphere. Um, so things that um, take into account some of those nuances within uh, discrete patient communities and educational materials that are communicated in a way that is culturally competent, uh, that is sensitized to the unique needs of that community, and generating that content, uh, I would say is certainly an area that, you know, that we're looking at. We're, we're gonna kind of do certain things within our existing research programs to ensure that we do a better job of communicating to those respective communities, making the informed consent uh, process simple and more streamlined, bringing in the right stakeholders within families and caregivers to, uh, to be a part of those discussions. So you know, we're doing things internally, but I, I would certainly say uh, that's an area where we can look for new ideas and partnerships from advocacy groups and nonprofits is that type of educational materials. And I think that ties the two questions together is maybe one way you can tackle the uh, health disparity um, grant opportunity that exists. Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Pabalita Thomas. I'm the business developer uh, director over at the Canadian MPS no. Society. Speak up. Yeah, yeah there we I go. Put it closer? Okay. okay. Um, I actually wanted to, um, I know in Canada we do things a little bit different than in the U.S., but I do know that the U.S. and Canada, we have, con um, sorry, um, con sorry, I speak French, so I'm trying to think it in English. Um, the government representatives in each country's like, um, uh, like consulates, yes, yeah. that's the word. Um, and in Canada, we have consulates that focus on international health reforms and policies that helps nonprofits and um, foundations and societies to connect on the ground. So I don't know if in the U.S. there's something similar. I'm pretty sure there is because a lot there's a lot of governmental um, processes and procedures that are very um, similar. But um, that is a good way because that is what they're mandated to do. So that may be a way of um, entering in these countries and having someone on the ground that understands about you know the political impacts, the cultural sensitivity communications and really help you in that facet. Um, so I just wanted to say that out loud because I wasn't quite sure if there was anybody else uh, maybe in that same boat. Um, also, in terms of um, your question, I know you talked, I forgot her name, but she talked about um, having um, ways to tap into funding for translation services. That's huge in Canada um, because uh, like in the US, you, we have individuals within the MPS um, space that all speak different languages. And um, we've been able to tap into our Ministry of Health. And French is a translation services they provide for free because Canada is a in French and English, but we've been able to tap into um, getting free translation services from um, um, embassies that have um, their embassies, say, in Washington or something, and they will provide that services for free. So that might be another option as well. And my actual question was to you, Garen. Um, I think cultural sensitivity is really important. I know at our society, that's at the forefront of everything. Communication, stakeholder relations, policy implementing, like Im implementation. So I wanted to know if your um, organization has any resources in that sense for small nonprofits um, like ours that are trying to ensure that we are spreading the information about research and the diversity and the inclu inclusion being at the forefront because it seems that's what you guys are focused on. And I wanted to know if there was any sort of resources on your website and if not, why don't you put it on? <laughs> yeah. 
because we'll definitely tap into that for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I thank you for putting the pressure on me to, to, to deliver on, on some of that. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> um, so, well, yes, I think not yet, but it's coming. So I think we, we've been at this work now for about the better part of about two years. I think first, the first charge was making sure that uh, we made a strong uh, business case for why our organization needs to invest in this. I think we found that there was a, a good moral reason this is the right thing to do for patients. Uh, and when you're in rooms, big and small, I think people feel that that kind of moral charge, and that motivates some people, and some people actually take action when they leave the room, uh, but that doesn't necessarily motivate everybody. Sometimes there needs to be that rational kind of, you know, what is my return on this type of, you know, investment of resources to, to deliver on a specific objective. So we had the hearts. I think, the, you know, folks, you get the hearts when people come in the room and you just tee up the subject, uh, but we had to get the minds, and so we really had to spend some time uh, really understanding our research operations, understanding where we're going as a business, where healthcare is going, and really localize this concept of uh, rich, uh, heterogeneous data and why that's so important for personalized healthcare. And we're talking race and ethnicity, but there's a lot of other kind of aspects of healthcare, health attributes that are really important, kind of this macro environment of social determinants of health that can all be, eventually will feed into uh, you know, where we hope to go with personalized healthcare. So once we did that, and I think we, we got a really strong argument there, I think that unlocked a, a lot of support and a lot of resources, you know, across leadership and across the organization. So, you know, that was the better part of a year or so doing that, getting our ducks in a row, uh, helping where we can within our research functions. The next wave of this is investing in materials that can help um, just elevate this topic of discussion in, in different community settings and through different channels. Uh, so that, that's coming next, but I, I would say like one resource that I've found to be very rich uh, that we've kind of looked at for guidance is the FDA's Office of Minority Health. Uh, so their website, uh, they have a ton of videos about what clinical trials, clinical research. I use research because there is a lot of nuance in the way language is used in this subject that can be off-putting to some or that can help, uh, that can shut down conversations with certain groups. And so no one likes to be you know, on trial thinking about this as a criminal defense trial. You don't want somebody to try things out on you. So I think the nuance of language is really important. Some of the FDA's Office of Minority Health Resources actually address the, uh, the importance of the language that you use to tee up this type of, type of conversation. So that's one area that you can go to now that you know, has a repository of things. And, uh, and we just hope to kind of supplement the stuff that they're doing. And, and bring some new things out there over the next couple of years. We're, uh, we're over a little bit, about 15 minutes or so. Um, so in the interest of you guys getting to get something to eat, we're gonna have one more question here. Hello, uh, my name is Jennifer Farabee and I'm with the NR2F1 Foundation, which represents families affected by Bosch Booster Shaft Optic Atrophy Syndrome. Thank you. Um, and I'm the social media manager for them. And we started about last October. And since then, we've actually been able to campaign and raise over $30,000 using Facebook and fund our first project. Um, my question is, is it better to focus on one uh, social media site, so I'm focusing most of my efforts on Facebook right now and do that really well, or is it better to spread out amongst the different um, social media sites and cover all of those areas, but maybe not be able to post as often, not be able to have such a high level of consistency that I'm able to have using just one platform? Uh, and the answer to that is best driven by who are you trying to reach. Okay. So back to that, that point about who is the ideal audience. If, you're, if your audience is fundraisers, if that's the main objective for your social media is to raise, fu raise funds, then Facebook may be your most effective channel and you just could continue to focus on, on that. If your desire was to reach researchers and mm -hmm and others to find out if there's more support for research for your disease, then you'd be going to Twitter for that. Okay. It's really important not to spread yourself too thin okay. because it's the consistency and repetition of the message that builds your audience in that particular platform. Okay, okay. Can I Thank add into much. that? Okay. I can tell you 
for fundraising purposes, Facebook is a great avenue to do that. Our organization has raised over $20,000 just in birth birthday fundraisers off of Facebook, and we've not hit the year end yet. So if, if what you're trying to do is raise money, and that's a goal, like Dan is saying, it's definitely worth your time to invest in that. But if the goal is to do that and send messages to your other stakeholders mm -hmm. through, you know, maybe start a, a fundraising strategy or, or calendar, which has, you know, worked for us, to hit, you know, a couple of those other ones along with it. But main focus can be, you know, promoting the, base, the Facebook fundraisers and sharing those. It really, it really does, you know, it is worth investing the time in just one depending on the goal. But spreading it a little bit, you gotta, you gotta do a little bit. Okay, little bit um, and so if we wanted to reach researchers and those in the scientific community, which platform would you recommend to be the best for that? LinkedIn, mm -hmm. Twitter? I think, I think Twitter and, and YouTube Twitter. are your best platforms because a lot of that research is, videos are being posted on YouTube by doctors, hospitals, and clinics mm -hmm. to promote that way. You know, I make most of my connections that way on LinkedIn. I'm not scared to find someone and connect with them and message them. Okay, so they, you they say may LinkedIn not answer. And you say yeah. Twitter. <laughs> What's that? You're saying LinkedIn and you're saying Twitter. Yeah. Right. Yep. I'd say LinkedIn, Twitter. Both can yeah. be effective right. for sure. Yeah. Maybe I'll flip a coin. <laughs> LinkedIn, if you're zeroing in on a particular yeah. person. Mm -hmm. yeah. Twitter, if you're looking for the broader market with the hashtag that might be related. Yes. Okay. Okay, thank yeah. you so much, guys. Yeah, good question. Okay, well, thank you so much. I appreciate it and appreciate your patience for answering questions over the time. Um, just have a little something up here. Kind of this. All, right, All right, thank, thank you, you to so Dan, much. Roberta, and Garen for your expertise and knowledge. Um, at this time, we ask that you jump onto the mobile app and take our brief survey to let us know what you think. Uh, we will now be moving into the lunch break, which is proudly sponsored by Pfizer. Um, on your way out to lunch, check out the resource table outside the room. You'll find some of the uh, Global Genes rare toolkits and resources provided by some of the different speakers throughout the day. Um, our ne next breakout session will be at 1 o'clock. Uh, thank you very much and enjoy your lunch.